Have you ever been waiting for the train somewhere and wondered how those railway signals by the side of the track work? Or have you been playing a train sim and wanted a handy guide on New Wales railway signalling? Don't worry, you're not alone. This is going to be the first in a series of videos where I explain the operation and history of New South Wales railway signalling. This first episode is going to focus on the modern colour light signalling system. To begin with, I need to discuss a few basic concepts and rules. The first is block signalling, which most railways around the world, including New South Wales, use. Simply put, it's the concept of only allowing one train to occupy a section of line at a time. This can be done through fixed blocks, such as between signals, or moving blocks around the train, such as in communication-based train control systems, which will be the focus of a future video. It is important to note that there are exceptions. The second topic is the difference between automatic and controlled signals. In New South Wales, automatic signals are controlled exclusively by track circuits and will only allow a train to proceed past them if the next signal block is empty, while controlled signals are directly controlled by the signaller, who gives authority for trains to proceed into the next block. In general, automatic signals can be differentiated by the signal lights being offset vertically from each other, or the addition of an A plate or light if the signals cannot be staggered. It is important to note that there are semi-automatic signals, which are able to switch between controlled and automatic when need be. These can be identified by a white A light that will light up when in automatic mode. The final topic is signal designation. These are generally broken down by signal type. Controlled signals can be out of home, home, starting, or home and starting. Out of home signals are used to control entry to the block ahead, but not necessarily protect points or other identified risks. These signals can often be identified by the addition of an OH plate. Home signals are used to protect points and other identified risks, such as level crossings. Some home signals are permanently at stop, and these are referred to as fixed reds. They are generally placed where trains can terminate on the opposite direction's running line. Starting signals are used to control departure from a controlled area, such as a station or yard, and home and starting signals have the function of both home and starting signals. These are typically used on single track lines with passing loops such as the Richmond line, although not exclusively. It is important to note that controlled signals are exclusively used within yard limits. Yard limits can be identified by a YL sign when entering a yard and an EYL sign when exiting. When transferring from one yard to another, there will be an EYL and YL sign alongside the track which indicates the yard being left and the yard being entered. Automatic signals have two types. Automatic, which only displays a proceed aspect if the next signal block is clear, and distant, which only has the ability to display a clear or caution aspect. Distance signals will have a plate marked distant on them, and some distance signals can display a stop aspect. When a distance signal can display a stop aspect, it will have a sign with the instruction, when this signal is at stop, wait one minute, then proceed to the next signal cautiously. With that covered, we can finally discuss the running signals. Just as a starting note, New South Wales uses two kinds of full height signals, double light and single light. I'll be showing the aspects for both where applicable. The first and most important is stop. This aspect can be responded to in two different ways depending on whether it's an absolute or permissive signal. An absolute signal cannot be passed at stop unless authorization from the signaler is provided. A permissive signal can be passed under certain conditions but only after coming to a complete stop waiting for the signal to clear in the expected time and waiting an additional minute. If the driver sees the block ahead is obstructed, they are required to obtain permission from the signaler to proceed. If the driver is unable to see the whole block ahead, then they are allowed to proceed only after attempting to contact the signaler. If the driver can see that the whole block ahead to the next signal is unobstructed, they are allowed to proceed without contacting the signaler. If the driver passes a stop signal without contacting the signaler, they are required to attempt to contact the signaler at the next attended location with the number or location of the signal passed as well as the condition of the line. In all cases, if the signal informs them not to proceed, they must wait until given authority or the signal clears. 
the driver also must record the time, the number or location of the signal passed, and the designation of the signal passes at stop. Additionally, single light signals will have an additional light provided below the main light, which lights up red if the signal is at stop, or if the signal is in functioning. The general rule of thumb is that all automatic signals are permissive, while all controlled signals are absolute. Automatic signals can become absolute signals under certain conditions, such as when signed, or if they can be switched between automatic and controlled. But the full details can be found in the document NSG600, which can be found in the description. The next aspect is low speed and the related close up aspect. Low speed requires an additional green light attached to the lower signal head or below the main lamp in the case of a single head signal. A low speed signal allows a train to proceed under the assumption that the next block is occupied where train stops are provided Trains are only allowed to pass a low speed signal at 25 km per hour or less. For those who don't know what a train stop is, they're also known as a trip cock and they're that small lever device that lowers and raises to stop trains. These systems are common in many urban rail networks around the world, albeit with slight variations. In New South Wales, the train stops are always mounted on the left side of the track in the direction of travel. In operation, if the train is not permitted to proceed, the arm raises, and if a train attempts to pass, the tripcock arm will hit another lever on the train, which releases the air pressure in the train's brakes. Historically, these were used alongside low speed signals in the city circle to regulate train speed into platforms in order to allow multiple trains enter and depart a platform simultaneously. This was done by having train stops between each train to ensure that the trains never entered the same block. More commonly, they're used to stop trains passing a stop signal. The close up signal, is very similar, but with the addition of a close-up plate above the additional light, and no speed restriction when passing the signal, even when train stops are provided. Close-up signals are also very rare, and it seems they're actively being removed. Thankfully, the next set of aspects are much more straightforward. Caution indicates that the train is allowed to proceed, but the next signal may be at stop. This consists of a green over red aspect, or a single yellow aspect. Medium indicates that the next signal is at minimum a caution aspect or caution turnout aspect. This is either a green over yellow aspect or a flashing yellow aspect. Preliminary medium indicates that the next signal is at least medium. This consists of a green light over a flashing yellow light and as such can only be displayed on a double color light signal. And finally, clear indicates that the train is allowed to proceed and the next signal also displays a proceed aspect. This is either a green over green aspect or a single green aspect. The next group of aspects indicate that a train is going to proceed onto a turnout route. A turnout refers to a track that diverges from the current running line. This can either be a siding or a junction. These signals typically differ from normal running signals by the addition of an additional yellow light on the upper signal head in double light installations, but there are exceptions. Sometimes there will be a turnout repeater mounted to the prior signals in order to warn oncoming trains of the upcoming turnout. Repeaters are provided for the length it would take the train at track speed to slow down to the turnout speed. At the signal protecting the turnout, there is typically a route indicator which will show a letter or number indicate which route the train will be taking alongside a lower turnout indicator on single light signals. The first aspect is caution turnout, which indicates that the train is allowed to proceed on the turnout route, but the next signal may be at stop. This consists of a yellow above red aspect or a red aspect above a turnout indicator with steady yellow lights. Medium turnout indicates that the next signal is at least caution or caution turnout. The following signal may be clear. This consists of either a double yellow aspect or a red aspect above a flashing yellow turnout indicator. The next major type of signals are shunting signals. Shunting is for when a train is working in a yard or otherwise not in mainline service. A common example of this is two four car trains being combined into an eight car train. These signals come in two types, additional lights on full size signals and dwarf signals. For full size signals, there are an additional light below the main signal head. Dwarf signals 
come in two general designs, a triangular position light design and a vertical light design. These are typically located by the side of the track and are only designed to be viewed at low speed. Stop functions, the same as normal running signals. For full size signals, the shunting signal will be off, while on dwarf signals, it will consist of two red lights. Intermediate shunting signals only come in dwarf form and are placed between two full size signals in the same direction. When the first running signal displays a proceed indication, the intermediate shunting signal displays proceed for the running movement. An intermediate shunting signal may be used to authorize a shunting movement. Calling on signals are attached to home signals and indicate that the points ahead are locked, but the line may not be clear. Shunt ahead signals are attached to starting or home and starting signals and indicate that the train is allowed to shunt past the signal. Dead end signals are fitted to home or home and starting signals only and indicate that the train is clear to proceed into a dead end siding. The signal will be offset in the direction of the siding. Finally, we get to the more miscellaneous signals you'll see around the network. These signals often have special rules or serve more specialized purposes. Repeater signals, as the name would suggest, repeat a signal. They're mainly placed ahead of an upcoming signal to give warning. They come in three main types, color light, which displays in full detail the next aspect, and LED and position light, which display only proceed or stop. Repeaters can be identified by the word repeater printed on a sign attached to the signal. Often, repeaters can have the same ID number as the signal they're repeating. Color light repeaters may display stop if the line between the repeater and the next signal is occupied. Co-acting signals are similar to repeaters, but they're often placed next to the main signal to improve visibility. They come in the form of dwarf and full-size signals. Tunnage signals are placed at the beginning of steep grades. These are fitted with a sign near or on the signal instructing what trains it applies to and under what conditions. These are to ensure that heavy freight trains do not have to stop while climbing grades, as doing so means they might not be able to resume. The normal procedure is for a train to wait until the signal clears to a prescribed aspect. Tonnage signals can also be fitted with a T indicator, which if it is lit, drivers of prescribed trains may disregard the tonnage signal. Guards indicators are pretty simple. They're similar to co-acting signals, where they improve the visibility of a signal, but instead for the guard, they're generally placed on platforms that have curves or something that would obstruct the guard's view of the departing signal. They let the guard know when the driver has the upper seat indication, so the guard knows when the train is able to depart. Point and catch point indicators are used to indicate the position of points or catch points. They are similar to dwarf signals and will display a stop indication if the points are not set. If the points are set, a white arrow in the direction of the points will be displayed. Dead end lights are placed at the end of dead end sidings to indicate that trains should stop. This typically consists of a single red light, but if it can be confused for a stop indication, on another line, a white signal is placed above the red light. Before we get onto signals in practice, I need to talk about signal failures. How you respond to these is pretty straightforward. You look for the most restrictive aspect. In this first case, the top signal light has failed, while the bottom is displaying a red aspect. We look for the most restrictive aspect, which in this case is a stop signal. So we treat the signal as a stop signal. For this next signal, the bottom light has failed, while the top light is displaying a green aspect. Applying the same logic as before, we assume this signal is a caution aspect. For the next signal, the signal is displaying no aspect, but the marker light is displaying a red signal, which means this signal is at stop. But if the marker light is off and the main signal is blank, it means either the signal is a proceed aspect or the signal isn't functioning at all. To be safe, it's treated as the signal has failed completely, and it's treated the same as stop. For the final signal, it displays a red over green aspect. In New South Wales, this is an illegal aspect, as there is no aspect that consists of that combination of lights. As a result, it's assumed the signal has failed, and it is treated as a stop signal. With all that, we've covered all colour light signals that can be encountered on the New South Wales railway network, but if you're like me, you'll need a demonstration to understand how it actually works in practice. For this, we'll look at a few case studies. To start with, we'll cover a basic double track running line. For simplicity's sake, this is all outside of yard limits, so all signals are automatic. 
On the top, we have double color lights, and on the bottom, we have single color lights. Since there are no trains ahead of ours, the signals all display clear. As our train enters the first block, the previous signal indicates stop, preventing traffic from entering the same block as our train. As our train continues, the previous blocks change to more permissive aspects. First, they cycle through caution, then medium, then preliminary medium, and then clear. As the single color light signal cannot display preliminary medium, it just returns to clear. This is one of the benefits of the double color light system. It provides more information about the state of the line further ahead than a single color light system. As for stations, it's nearly identical. As the train proceeds along the line, the previous signal drops to stop and then gradually becomes more permissive as the train continues. Passing loops are a bit more complex. For those who don't know, a passing loop exists to allow trains traveling in different directions to pass each other safely on a single track. Real life examples of this would be certain sections of the Richmond and Illawarra lines. Here, we have the same setup as before, with double color light signals on top and single on bottom. The difference is we are now within yard limits, so we have controlled signals. From left to right, we have a distant signal, then a home signal, and then home and starting signals protecting the loop. In this situation, the distant signal is the only automatic signal, and because it's a distant signal, it can only display clear or caution. Its only purpose is to inform the driver of the state of the upcoming home signal. The home signal is placed before the points to protect entry to the passing loop. The signals protecting the loop itself are home and starting signals. They are home signals because they protect the points exiting the loop, and they are starting signals because they start trains on their journey outside of the loop. In operation, as the train approaches the loop, if there is a train on platform one, the home signal will display stop, and the distance signal will display caution. However, if there is no train in that block, the home signal will show clear and allow a train onto platform one. In general operation, trains will use the loop track in their direction of travel. So up trains will use the up track and down trains will use the down track, but there are exceptions. It is also important to note that only one train will be allowed on a single track line at a time. And if there is a single train in that block, all signals protecting the line will display stop. When a train departs a loop, the signal aspects follow the same rules as before, just over a longer distance. Now we get onto junctions and more complex stations. To start with, junctions are fairly straightforward. Junctions are within yard limits and are protected by home signals in all directions. If the train is turning out, the preceding signal will display a turnout aspect. If the train is continuing straight, the signal will display the normal proceed aspect. This applies to all type of junctions, whether they are turnouts, such as at Cabramatta, or crossovers, such as at Walleye Creek. Next up, we have more complex stations. This station has three platforms, two on the main line and one on a side platform. Real life examples would include MacArthur and East Hills. For a train traveling on the up main, it can terminate at platform two or three, but first it has to traverse a home signal. In general, if the train is continuing through on the main, it will display a clear aspect, but if it is terminating, the signal will normally be equipped with a route indicator to inform the driver of which track they will be terminating at. In this case, it will show two or three to correspond to the terminating platform, and then display a turnout indication. If the train is terminating on platform two, it will encounter a fixed red at the end of the platform. This is to protect the running line behind it by preventing wrong direction traffic. If the train is terminating on platform three, it will encounter the end of the track, which will have a dead end light to indicate that the train is stopped. In this case, the previously mentioned fixed red is within the driver's visibility, so the dead end light has an additional white light to avoid confusion. In the opposite direction, there will be a home signal that controls the exit of the terminating platform. But if the train is also exiting a yard, these signals will be combined home and starting signals. For my final example, we'll be covering shunting aspects. For this example, we have a basic stabling yard. There is a home signal on the left, this controls traffic continuing on the main and traffic entering the yard. On the signal, there is a shunt aspect and two route indicators. If the train is continuing on the main route, the signal will display a normal or proceed aspect without an indication. If the train is continuing onto one of the platforms and terminating, 
it will display a turnout aspect with a U or D on the larger indicator to show the platform it is terminating at. If the train is shunting into one of these platforms, the shunt aspect will light up and the lower route indicator will show UM or DM to indicate which platform the train will be shunting onto. If the train will be traveling into the stabling yard, the lower route indicator will show a US indicator to indicate that the train is shunting into the sidings in the up direction. Once the train passes the shunt aspect for any platform, the driver has to proceed under a speed restriction and with the expectation that the platform or track is occupied. Examples of this in practice include storing multiple trains on a single track or combining two four-car trains into a single eight-car train. With that, we've covered the basics for how colour light signalling works in New South Wales. I have intentionally left out some systems, such as mechanical signalling, and more modern systems, such as ATP and ETCS, but that's because they'll be the focus for a future video. I hope you enjoyed, and if you did, please like and please subscribe.